Should I start? Okay. Good evening to all of you since it's 4.30 already. Today marks the, in a way, two years to the very first time I presented this topic in front regarding electronic literature. So I was in my master's semester four when I first presented electronic literature as a topic in front of my classmates and sir, of course. And uh, well, it was well received and I thought maybe it's a really good, interesting topic to explore for research. And uh, yeah, that's what I did. So for two years, since two years, I've been working on this. And once again, I'm here to introduce the field of electronic literature to all of you. Have you ever heard these two terms together? Like the word electronic and the word literature. Before this, anywhere, somewhere, never? Well, the word electronic is often associated with a lot of digital spaces, a lot of devices, yes. We call electronic devices, that's what we have as a term, right? Uh, but literature is never thought of to be uh, electronic in nature. It was never thought of as long as ELIT wasn't there. So let's see how these two terms work and what are the changes, what are the significant distinctive aspects of this field and how is it different from literature which we understand today right what is it contributing to our understanding of literature how have we understood literature so far and what is elit doing to that understanding is it changing it is it modifying it is it adding to that understanding or is it just something of a uh, well distinctive characteristic of literature or is it a new field altogether Yes. So the first thing, the first uh, slide, as you see, I've changed the slide. The title is What Might ELIT Be? Now, in this slide, what I ask you to do is chip in a few words which you can associate with the term electronic literature. Anything, anything which comes to your mind when you hear the term electronic literature. These are two terms, right? Electronic and the word literature. Now you can add any word related to this term. Think of any word and just add it. We'll see how many of you put in your ideas and what are the various suggestions which we get. You'll see three options for three to four options, I guess, to add your words there. Any word and just submit and we will see it on the screen here. Let me see what you think. Okay, someone said digitalized literary work. Okay, that's a really good way of expressing it. Who was it? Thank you. Data poems, generative literature. Okay. That's a great start. Digital text. Anything else? Generative literature, auto generated literature. Very good. A lot of generative literature generated by technology. Digital world. Who, who is it who added the digital world? Yes, you can just raise your hand. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Coded text. Very good. Anything else? Seven responses so far. Absence of human in literature. Okay. A very philosophical way to put it, but yes. Digital technology. Digital books. Okay. 
something. Absence of emotions. Who is this? We will come to that point later. But, well, that's a good observation. Anything else? Are you all able to respond to the PPT? Okay. Electronic literature. E exams. Who is it? Yes. Okay. Well, that's great. Generated by technology. Digitalized. Okay, that was there. Digitalized meets. Okay. Speedy literature. Who is speedy literature? Well, you see how our ways of thinking are projected here. What are the abstractions which you associate with the term elite when you are just encountered it with it for the very first time okay? when you hear the word electronic literature this is what you come up with right and we will see how these terms differ in their meaning in their understandings as we move with the presentation you see elite doesn't have a specific definition to speak of you can never tie up elit into a one sentence or a two sentences of definition. There is always something new happening with elit. And this is what I think is its distinctive, distinctive quality as a literary genre or a literary field. Right? So practical imaginary text that is true, bounded with quoting, true. All these things are correct. And uh, thank you so much for this interesting responses. But well. There was one person who had to do it, right? So someone who had to provide a definition just for introduction, introductory purposes. So Catherine Hales is considered to be the founder or sort of the person who actually began the traditional ways of introducing elite to people. She started publishing books. She started talking about it in conferences. She provided this definition. And people started to think about Elit as a field of knowledge. Right? And what does he what does she say here? She says it's not digitalized print. Now the very term digitalized is removed from the description of Elit. So how would you do it? You said a lot of people added that word, right? The digitalized text, the digitalized word, digitalized literature, digitalized. Uh, stories and things like that. But when it is not digitalized, how do you call it an e lit text? Okay. So, well, it is not digitalized print. That is one. That is, if you are just uploading a PDF on the web, that is not e -lit. That is, you are just creating one version of the text there. Right? You are not uh, connecting with the very idea of e lit, and that is to be born digital. A e lit to call it an e -lit, e lit text, you have to consider it as a text which is very much interactive in nature, which can be only and only used on the PC or on the device or on the web, right? And also, it is completely and totally created through the digital and electronic opportunity. Okay? So, it can be a poem which you generate through a poetry generator, for example. That can be any look. But if you write a poem on the sheet of paper and then click a photo or create a PDF and then upload it on your blog, for example, so that is not it. So very quite a very good distinction is provided there. Yes. Yeah, it's more of, uh, well, interacting in a wider range of uh, ways than just typing. You see, sometimes we don't even have to type. We just have to click or we just have to scroll through the screen. That can be an elite interaction as well. Sometimes you just have to breathe. 
well we have examples of illiterates which have been created by the ways in which people are breathing they monitor breathing and then they well, project your thoughts on the screen and they create a text this was something really shocking for me as well as a research scholar like this was presented by one of the experts during one of uh, our seminars and they said yes this is possible so now see how it is working it might not be typing at all you might not be using a device at all and you will still be creating a text there right so you might not have to learn to code right you added coded text to the word cloud there right but you don't have to learn to code in order to create a unique text that is also true right poetry generators don't require you to code at all you just need to click you just need to go through the options available there right you select words so that's what you do and then well it is elit for you so it is not digitized print so if you are working on a project where you uh, try to make an archive uh, as we have seen in the digital library archives and all those things right literary archive you find it everywhere even uh, the indian government has the national digital library and all those things the archival practices are not a part of elit that is for sure why because they are working with for the original yes. print literature yeah. and then they are turning it into a digital text right? so you can't call it e lit yeah. so very clear cut distinction between what to call e lit and what not to call e lit yeah. right? so that is what catherine hales did and at her time like you know when she was creating this definition the computer was the latest technology so you find the word computer there today we know that yes today we know that computer is well not so much of a latest technology then right it's more of web based now and we will see how the word electronic turns into the word digital also right what do we mean by the word electronic and what do we mean by the word digital so that is also there so elit as a field right it is very much distinctive in its nature in its Yes. Uh, sorry for the disturbance in between. Uh, the the device is getting connected again, uh, and then we will continue with uh, the the presentation. Sorry for a brief uh, interruption in between. Uh, Prakruti Bhatt is making a presentation uh, on e literature, and this will be followed by Kavisha Alagia's uh, presentation. now since it is literature it has to have genres right in literature in traditional literature you have things like what african literature american literature indian literature new literature and moderns and postmoderns and all those people did so when well, elit has its own genres now you see how it is also trying to cope up with the traditional idea of literature because at the end of the day people still are going to ask you like if it is a type of literature what are its genres is there poetry there is there going to be prose is there going to be some kind of criticism being involved right so definitely people are going to ask you and you can answer them by these types these are a few genres of uh, e lit the very first one and the oldest to sort of point out at the historicity of e lit is hypertext which will be introduced in at length by by kavisha uh, the other one was code poetry where you coded the your expressions and then the machine used to give you an outcome an output in terms of poetic expressions there you just need to code what you think your words right and then it the poetry that came out of the machine was called code poetry but interestingly enough code poetry had a lot of codes uh, to call it poetry at all 
So a lot of people said, well, these are just list of quotes. This is not poetry. Right? And it was really difficult to grasp the literary from the web of quotes available on the screen. So, well, a very difficult task for literary people. So, and yet, quote poetry is still in use at some or the other level where people create softwares, where people create web pages for interactive poetry and coding and all those things. Right? So, quote poetry, a very prominent genre of lit is available. The third one is, well, you might have been heard of quote poetry right? and how AI works with it. Now, the thing with AI is, well, you can't design an AI, right? For that, you need a technician. You are a student of literature. How are you going to work with AI? Are you, will you be able to ever create an AI for yourself in order to call yourself an author? That would be your question. If, for example, in the future, if you want to be recognized as an author, okay, would you be able to create an AI? Well, if not today, then perhaps later, but you will have to work with AI at some level, right? So AI is well changing the ways in which not just literature, but all fields of knowledge are being challenged, right? And uh, AI has to be a part of it because well, at the end of the day, it is still technology. And a lot of experiments used to happen in the early 2000s with the computer and the technology that it came out with. And a lot of people said, well, let's plan to have an AI that works on a computer, right? And uh, it interacts with you. So the very first time someone actually ever interacted with a computer in terms of AI as an AI was around the early 2002, right? Where you find someone entering an entire grammar and grammatical rules into an AI. So all the algorithms were added, all the codes were added to the AI, the computer, and then people were told, you just go there, click on a few uh, buttons, and see if you can come up with any poetic or literary expression. There. So, well, that is how they started off with bot poetry and AI. Today, you find an actual AI standing in front of you and not just a computer screen. Right? So you have the examples of Sophia or any other AI bot available. Another version of it is the web-based AI. Right? The web-based AI works in the form of a website. If you can click on the website. There is an example of it in the later slide. You will see. And you just need to, well, work with hyperlinks. There. Click and work. Click and work. And that's how works there and AI is responding to you as a web platform and not just a machine. So that is there. Then literary gaming. This I guess must have been uh, like you know introduced to somewhere at some length. I hope so. Because literary gaming is a very prominent uh, genre of field which is gaining a lot of popularity these days. Uh, have you ever played video games or uh, games on your mobile phones where you Proceed with each level, and there's a story unfolding with each level. Well, that's a part of literary gaming there, where a story is at the center of the game, and you have to play the game in order to create the story. And it develops from one level to another. Now, this kind of a thing is again enhanced with the very idea where you don't need to play the uh, like you know the levels, but you need to create the story. And it works as a game too. So, for example, you might add a few expressions to the already existing narrative, and you will get messages like, wow, this is a great input, right? And then you move to another page. So, you will get score points for each expression you add to the narrative, right? So, that is how, again, that is also a way in which literary gaming is working. These are all, these are some of the genres of elit which uh, you might or you should be aware of. The another is blog fiction. Now, uh, a kind of fiction that is a created through a sequence of blog posts. Okay? Uh, and blogs were very much popular when they first came out and because, also because of the WWW revolution there, right? the World Wide Web and the creation of the blog provided people to have their own personal space of writing literature. So uh, people had a lot of 
uh, well, stereotypical ideas about who should be the creator of a literary text. Right? They said you should have some kind of creativity, you should have some aesthetics there, you should have some romanticized idea and idealized viewpoints regarding literature in order to be an author of a literary text. Right? Blog fiction broke those barriers. When the web came up, and people's everyday lives also became a part of the story. So you see, a lot of realism was involved in literature because of blog fiction. Right? Since literature became an everyday activity, people started writing blogs every single minute of the day, right? And every post had something new to add to the existing story. Right? So a sequence of posts, and you have an entire story available. So well, that was blog fiction, and it brought literature to the general public, it brought literature to uh, everyone and everyone available on the web, right? So well then, we divide electronic literature into two eras. Well, in, in your traditional literature, you have things like the Elizabethan era, in uh, the postmodern era, right? The modern era and things like that. Enlightenment era. In electronic literature, we divide it into two uh, eras, and that is one is the pre web and the other is the post web. So, the analog systems of the computer, the screen, the PCs is considered to, the, to be the pre web era where you need to learn to code, right? You need to know algorithms, you need to know how a coded text works in order to create an elite text. That was pre web where web didn't exist, but yet there was technology and people started creating their works there. The post web is because of, as I mentioned earlier, the World Wide Web phenomenon and the post web era, which introduced a lot of possibilities for literature. Because now you have an entire web, an entire space for you. So blog fiction, a result of the post web era. Your AIs, a result of the post web era. Your websites, your Wattpads, your social media. Everything is a result of the post web era because without the web, you can't have these things there, you can't have these platforms, right? And as a result, electronic turns into the digital. So, electronic by electronic, the term we mean the traditional, the one where you code things, create algorithms, and then there is a software being created, and then there is something which you can work on a screen. There is some kind of a machine there. When in the digital era, you are just working with a website. There's just still a dot com at the end. Right? So, well, that is the post web era. That is because of the web, you have the shift from electronic to the digital there. Right? And also, uh, well, it is very obvious here, but you can also say that in the electronic era, you didn't have the digital because nothing was ever digitized. It was still a very analog system. And if you go to computer science department, they have things like the analog system and the digital system. Now, what are those things? Basically, things were not digitized and they didn't have a very good aesthetic, a very raw uh, analog system of working with uh, codes and uh, digits and everything. In the digital, you have a very good aesthetic, very good presentation of uh, your content on the web and also easily accessible. The analog systems were not accessible to everyone. You need to have a computer to work with an analog system. That is for sure. And, and which is why it is it was called electronic, because you needed an electronic device to work with your country. Right? But in the digital era, you don't need a device. You can connect through any device for that matter. Right? You can connect through any platform, and it would be a part of your experience. So yes, that was the shift from electronic the digital. Now, how is ELIT affecting literary practices? And what are the significant changes? Are there any particular characteristics which you can think of? The very first thing which comes to my mind and which is very significant is the idea of the readership or the collaborative writing technique. Because of ELIT and because of digital literature, you have something called the readership with a W. A combination of writer plus reader. Okay. So as a writer, as an author, you are also a reader. Okay. And 
as a reader you are also the creator of a text the outcome the literary outcome within an e lit or a digital literature scenario depends upon how you as a reader interacts with the text that is the understanding there okay so in order to work with hypertext for example you need to know what hypertext is you need to know what hyperlinks can be used for right also only and only if you click on a particular hyperlink will you be able to move on with the text otherwise you won't and so the question was who should be the author of this text the person who created the software the hypertext then or the reader who is clicking on the hyperlinks and then creating a story when you use a poetry generator there should be a question in your mind that am i the author of this work or is it the generator think about it who would you call the author or the writer of any lit text confusing well the answer is this you are both the writer and the reader in this scenario you are collaborating with the digital space in order to write literature now see this is a very challenging idea for someone who thinks that no humans are the only one who should be allowed to have literary expression machines can never write right machines are very monotone someone said about absence of emotions yes yeah so there is no emotions it is so monotonous but when you are interacting with the machine why can't you add your emotions to it right you are collaborating with the machine then you can add your emotions to the machine yes so well that that is where the whole idea of readership comes in so even in an era where you don't work with machines you still work with the web and if you want the web to add emotions to a literary text you should be the one to add it so if you are writing a story on wattpad and you want it to be a very good story a very popular story with a lot of human emotions there then you should you are the one who is writing it don't forget without you the space is just a space the web is just a web if you are not interacting with it okay so in order to add emotions add thoughts in expressions you should be the one to add it the other is the idea of the demotic authorship a very prominent idea in e lit right uh, demotic the word demotic comes with the idea of interacting with your audience and creating a text right? a demotic author was first introduced by arlai skeins it's a very recent concept around 2013 and she said well today's writers are not the one who sit in tranquility and write poetry today's writers they talk with their audience they chat with their audience uh, how many of you ever post quotes and poetry on social media anyone here 1 2 3 yes 4 5 well great show of hands in that case you are a demotic author already haven't you ever interacted with someone in the comment section saying yes wow your writing is so good i loved it things like that and when you said thank you and then there might have been uh, uh, someone who might have demanded a piece of writer ever okay right? someone who might have said okay can you write a poem on the current political situation can you write a poem for me uh, it's my birthday things like that yes that those are the people you are interacting with right that is you are already a demotic author in yourself someone who walks among their audiences that is what our lyle skeins said she said demotic author is someone who is walking among their audiences and creating literature as well as a figure of the future someone who is not just a human genius at the end of the day but someone who is very much normal and who is interacting with the digital medium to create literature right so that is demotic authorship for you next comes in now there are three people remember every time you talk about literature there are three people you should think of the first one the writer the second one the reader and the third one the publisher who is going to publish it without whom you have nothing for you right 
Well, in the digital publishing era, you have something called the attention economy, right? Uh, have you ever come across people who earn through their YouTube videos? Yes. Who earn through uh, their uh, digital story being published on uh, WhatsApps or any social media platforms? Then, uh, have you ever come across people who were never into the literary space, but just because their ebook got so popular, they are now rich. They have money, and you start thinking, okay. Shakespeare never did that, did he? Right. Well, today you have everyone being the author and earning. Shakespeare started, like you know, his career as someone who wanted to earn through his write-ups, right? And well, that's also something which. Okay. Well, yes. So that is what uh, digital publishing and attention economy is about. You earn as much attention you receive in your text. Yeah? So if you have uh, uh, people scrolling your story a lot of times, if you receive hundreds of likes, thousands of likes, 1Ks and 5Ks and all those things, they, so well, that is your economy that you earn through the amount of attention you receive on the digital space. That is your economy. And the digital publishing sphere. So now let me ask you this: literature is an outcome of what? Let me know what do you think? Is it the human genius or the affordances of the digital and the Type in and let's see what you come up with. It's an open-ended question, no correct answer. Okay, human genius. We have an idealist in the classroom. Human genius, affordances of the electronic and digital medium, emotions, who is this? Again, well, you're good going, don't worry, it's not bad, it's correct. That's it. Okay, someone who thinks of the human genius will definitely think of emotion. That is very obvious. So yeah, if you have an idealist and a very romanticized idea of literature, well, definitely you are going to add human genius. Okay, what do you think about this one? And there's a question in the, uh, below the slide there. So think about it. Is it making sense? No, no, you can just say, what, who do you think would have been the writer of this? Poem? Okay. Okay, e literature, correct. You see, there's something like this. Written by the user. Now, this is very strange, don't you think? 
no name of the writer often people go for such lenses creating their own pen names and things like that yes it's just the user right and inspired by ralph waldo well this is uh, the outcome of an interactive uh, session with uh, uh, a platform called verse by word you can check that uh, i don't have it here on the screen but it's a very popular medium it's a google site also an ai site a web based ai which you can work with verse by words that is the name right and yeah so let me add any questions which you can think of regarding the presentation it was still bits and pieces it wasn't in length i know but it might take the entire evening if i go on and on so yeah. you can add your questions through the ppt which you have i will answer it thank you Okay, so now uh, after Prakruti's presentation huh, on uh, e-literature, uh, we will have the next one by Kavisha Alagya huh, on her research on uh, electronic literature. So by the time I share my screen, I would like to ask you that do you have right now with you a novel or a book? Can you please open it? So is my screen visible in online? Is it visible? Okay, fine. So uh, you might have gone through the book and this is physical book. Pre Come to the middle part, but you won't be able to comprehend what is going on in the middle. Uh, before reading the first part right you have to start from the first page in order to grasp the meaning in order to understand what is written on the book and you have to finish the novel the book in order to develop a kind of plot in your mind in order to understand the meaning of the text in your mind so thank you for this now what if you have a complete different meaning of novel as you had already understood what is real literature now i am going to describe or talk on the digitalized form of novel or the electronic form of novel here you have you can see on screen here you uh, you have the hypertext which is created in a coded form then it is uh, published on the internet and is read on the internet and even critiqued on the internet so 
publishing, circulating, and re uh, readers are on the internet. Now you can see the 12 blue. It is on screen. The title of the our hypertext is 12 blue. Now why is it called a hypertext? It has some links. Can you see the links? There is this word begin. And if I want to click on it, then I think uh, it will show me something like here. If I'm clicking the word on the word begin, then it is showing me the eight bars or a graph or a diagram, you can say. Now, which number do you, would you like to have explore quickly? Fourth. So I'm clicking on the fourth. And a new narrative is emerging in front of us. She looked out on the creek and measured out the threads like fits. Now from here, your novel is starting. Your hypertext is starting. And if here, and we aren't given any kind of link. So what shall I do? If I want to read the another part of the text, where should I click? So here I'm given a uh, bar in that, I will click anywhere I like and the another narrative will appear. Now, after the first part, my second part of the text will be this thing. And here I'm given a link. So I will navigate to the link and the third part of my text will be visible. So here I am the one, I am the reader who will decide where to go, where to explore, where to navigate. So this thing is what I am uh, researching upon in my uh, PhD research titled as the narrative study of selected story space, hypertext fictions of Michael Joyce and Mark Bernstein. Now, uh, the story which we had, the hypertext we had, which we had explored was created on a story place, uh, story space platform and was, and the, uh, create, the publisher is Eastgate system. We had this publi uh, publication and the author, we have, uh, Bloomsbury Publishing House. So here in, in online mode, we have this Eastgate system. And if you want to explore more and more hypertext, varieties of hypertext, multimodal text, then you can go to electronic literature organization wherein you will find numerous texts available, numerous hypertext and e-literature uh, uh, e literature on this platform. Now, as uh, the previous research scholar has already explained what is e-literature. So my point, or uh, uh, looking at hypertext, well, from which perspective will I be looking at? It has this literary aspect because it is a hypertext or a novel. So it might be having this literary aspect. Then it has the, it was um, developed uh, by capably, by putting the uh, network computer at the center. So it is a kind of coded text, which was traditionally written then it was coded on computer and then people will be able to read that. Now from Legia. Now what is Legia? We had jumped from one link to another link. We had clicked somewhere while exploring the hypertext 12 blue. So that is Legia. Legia means chunks of text. You are given a paragraph then you, if you want to read another paragraph, you will have to click and then only you will be able to jump to another part or you will be able to read the another part of story. And as because it has a mode of storytelling, that, that is the reason we can include that in the genre of literature. And it is also experimentative in nature, experimental in nature. Why? Because if uh, one student will be reading from bar number three, another student will be reading from bar number eight. And if one student wants uh, like a traditional, uh, has this traditional mindset that he or she should be, uh, she will be reading from bar number one. So every reader will have a different idea of the plot. Every reader will have a different idea of the story, of the meaning, of the content. Coming to hypertext fiction, like Ted Nelson in his book uh, had tried to define what is hypertext fiction. So it is, first of all, it is non-sequential writing. Non-sequential means there is no any particular sequence. Then it allows read a choice to the readers. The readers are allowed. Like in this book, you cannot... Uh, uh, choose or select which page you want to start from. But in hypertext fiction, you are the uh, choice maker. You are the decision maker from which link or from which page you want to start reading. And it can be read on interactive screen only. 
like is this 12 blue if you want to search it out you can type in your google chrome 12 blue this uh, this uh, hypertext will be appearing in your mobile phone as well and you will be able to read on the uh, phones itself now there are chunks of text there as we have this pages here here we have in in our hypertext fiction chunks of text small small amount of text which will be linked to another thing and uh, which offer the readers different pathways reader have to go through reader have to constantly be conscious like which will which link will i be exploring next now my research explorations will be like how a hypertext fiction can be read obviously this sounds mundane this sounds tedious this sounds boring like who will be conscious every time to make choice to make decision so we, i will be exploring that kind of experience as well as examining the role of reader and as well as author reading uh, starting from w reader and author if i am uh, clicking on one link then i am becoming a writer itself and then if i am jumping to another link then i am also a writer and i uh, simultaneously i am also reading the text then some narratological aspects earlier we had this traditional narratological theory given by general janet here we don't have any um, uh, pre, uh, pioneer who had given this narratological theory to analyze the poetics or aesthetics of hypertext fiction so i will be exploring that how many researches have been done and how many how many dissertations have been written and what are the aspects which they are uh, uh, they have, they have incorporated the next thing is what happens in a work of art is the work of art itself so there is this joy of reading we have traditional joy of reading we sit on a couch take our coffee and we read the novel and we gain pleasure or we have this delight of reading here everything is distorted so uh, i am ex also exploring the experience of the distortion and exploring the again the idea of creativity human genius versus machine so what is that which is um, attracting readers to read the hypertext as hypertext is distorted anti novel kind of thing so there are certain aspects which uh, can be uh, put or taken into consideration in order to analyze the aesthetics of hypertext first is multilinearity need you have this text it is linear after one sentence there appears another sentence after one page appears another page after one unit or chapter there appears another chapter so it's a linear sequential now here when you are reading hypertext as i showed you it's non sequential it's multi linear and that is why it is multi linear and poetic way of thinking uh, that emphasizes analogy over analysis you have to interpret evaluate and uh, have a kind of analysis of the traditional print literature but it, when it comes to hypertext fiction you have to experience what first the process of reading because it is tedious like you will uh, get tired of reading without any plot without any particular mode of story people will find it hard or difficult to read further then it is obviously anti novel because it is destroying the whole concept of traditional novel that is why it is anti novel it is writer reader because you yourself as a reader are also writing simultaneously while reading that is it, it is why right uh, that is because of writerly text then is textual openness you can navigate any link you want if there are pictures then you can click on the pictures another picture will appear another book it might uh, appear if the writer or the coder had uh, coded that thing then uh, there is complete dissemination of meaning there is no meaning as such in this kind of hypertext if i am reading i am developing my own meaning if you are reading you are developing another kind of meaning which is totally different than mine so whose meaning will be considered as a uh, true meaning or whose interpretation will be considered as true interpretation and there is no closure if we re if i am reading this text i am getting attached with this text P characters are appealing to me characters are attracting me i am uh, experiencing what the characters are experiencing but if we are while reading hypertext this thing is totally disrupted now well, what kind of text to have i selected i have selected two hypertext sto stories and two hypertext fictions that is novels first is afternoon a story developed by the pioneer of hypertext fiction that is michael joyce second is 12 blue as uh, the illustration which i had showed you and there is twilight a symphony and trojan girls by mark bernstein now the challenges of my uh, research is that uh, this kind of texts are available at this many cost it's not at all cost effective so you will have to put a lot of efforts 
in order to uh, read the text. And if I am able to acquire the text or be, get access to the text, then it can be only be visible in Macintosh devices, not for Windows or not for Android. So it is not at all a kind of cost effective thing, but uh, would like to explore, I would like to explore the poetics of hypertext fiction and that's why I had selected this kind of text. Again, now if I want to analyze this text from a perspective, from my perspective, then I will have to look into the traditional uh, uh, pioneers. I will have to look into the all the uh, theories who had given kind of major theory. Again, this uh, challenge came, uh, uh, comes like electronic literature is a book written by Scott Redmond. And if I want to read the text, then I will have to order the text because PDF format is not available every time for this kind of literature. Because digital humanities, electronic literature is a new and developing form of uh, developing field. So every time we cannot have PDF of our desired text. So you can see the prices in order to read and to gain uh, knowledge. Again, if you want, like, some more examples I would like to show you. Here you can see the possible worlds of hypertext fiction. Uh, a book which I think that is totally related to my uh, research. If I want to read that, then I will have to pay 2000 something rupees. So for one text or for one book, for one embodiment of my research, I would have to pay lots of uh, rupees uh, to carry on with my research. Then there is another uh, writing space, another famous or what we say, I can rely my research on. That is how hardcover, Kindle and paperback, 5000 once again. <laughs> so these are the challenges for in my research and I'm going back. So this is what we are exploring. Thank you everyone. Here are the references or work cited if you want to go. Thank you. Any questions from your side? Yes. We can incorporate that questions in our uh, thesis yes. also. <laughs> yeah, actually. Is there any challenge in writing this
Okay, so okay, so uh, you might see uh, this uh, area is quite new and a bit difficult and challenging also. Still, whether I don't know, you will have be able to make the uh, all the dots gets connected properly or not. Like what is e literature? And uh, what kind of research can be done? Or what kind of questions can be raised to uh, uh, this? Uh, in traditional literature, we have all those approaches, like you apply feminist approach or diaspora literature or post-colonial studies and those things uh, one can easily apply and one can read. A linguistic study also can be done, psycholinguistic, sociolinguistic way of reading that literature. But in digital humanities, uh, the literature is generated also in a much different way. So electronic literature uh, and uh, what uh, Kavisha might have shown that the text can open anywhere, anytime. And every time you go to the text, it gives you a different text, a different narration. So very tough to read also, very tough to read uh, uh, the, the text. It keeps on changing its structure. So a very challenging way to read the narrative design of this storytelling. And then if you want to do traditional character study, it is even difficult also in this. Uh, more challenging will be like we still apply our traditional way of looking at electronic literature, but how to switch over will be very difficult also because once we have learned how to read traditional literature, it is nearly impossible for us to forget it and just see as a literature as an e-literature only. And that what we have already learned will not allow us to see the other things. So unless we get some way, uh, some idea, some some way that you you completely be forgetful of one type of literature that is traditional one, and then like you see that this is the only way the literature is written, then something may click in the mind, and then you can uh, think of the thing which is very challenging, very difficult, uh, also. So lots of seminar, conferences, gatherings, talk with everybody will slowly and steadily keep on opening uh, 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 the the path for this research. Uh, nowadays, normally the questions are this only that that literature has emotion, that literature has this meaning, that literature is that and that and this might not have those things. So it is still like a very shallow uh, uh, waters in which these questions are playing. We need to like take even the questions into the deeper realm where we can think of uh, the another uh, answers there. So whenever you begin the talk, people still dabble with those questions only whether it is this and that and uh, we are not able to take people into much deeper realm of looking at e literature uh, also so we hope but that by the end of their research after two three years something significant may come out and some of you also may take this path for your further research uh, uh, also in this so thank you both of you for making a good uh, presentation on the research that you are doing in digital humanities okay so with this we end our session here i will and then for tomorrow i will let you know what are our schedule for tomorrow thank you everybody thank you